Well, please follow along as I read chapter 1, verse 20 through, through chapter 2, verse 3. This is God's holy and authoritative living and abiding word. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass wither, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Well, Father, please bless the preaching of your word. You may have heard it said that the city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. Now, I have some questions about that. You see, my wife and I, Holly and I, lived in the city of Philadelphia, just outside the city of Philadelphia, um, for a couple of years, a number, a long time ago. And as a lifelong fan of the Dallas Cowboys, I was so excited to take my young sons to see the Cowboys beat the Eagles in the Eagles' own stadium there that year. So I mentioned this to my friends at the church there, some of the other, some of the pastors on staff. I mentioned this to them, asking for insight. Hey, wh- where do I get tickets? Where do I park? You know, what, what's the best concessions in the stadium? And they looked at me, and, they, and things got very serious very quickly. They were concerned about my plan. This, this idea was concerning to them. Maybe, maybe some of you already know why this idea was concerning to them. These friends, Philly natives, soberly warned me that my plan was unwise, I think one of them used the word foolish as he looked at me with incredulity in his eyes. They said, they informed me that Eagles fans have an earned reputation as passionate, certainly. That's usually the word that they start with. Perhaps some of you would say rowdy, maybe even rude to opposing teams, sometimes even to their own team. These are the fans who cheered when Dallas Cowboys Hall of Fame receiver Michael Irvin crumpled to the ground with a career-ending neck injury. They cheered. They booed Santa Claus. For many years, in fact, the Eagle Stadium was the only stadium in the country, the only stadium in the league that had an actual physical jail in their stadium. They had a judge on site for every game just to expedite the legal process. So my friends told me that if I took my young sons to an Eagles game wearing Cowboys gear, we likely would not make it inside without hearing all kinds of insults, probably having a a beer dumped on my head at some point, making my way in, Um, and that once inside, I should stay vigilant at all times, head on a swivel, looking around, being aware, and not calling attention to myself, and I should leave by halftime, especially if the Cowboys were winning. Now, believe it or not, we didn't go to an Eagles-Cowboys game that year. Nor did we, have I ever gone to a game uh, there. Now, I want to be careful here because I know firsthand that there are countless, countless kind and loving people in the city of Philadelphia. I have many friends there. I have many friends from there. We have people in this church from there. And I say that. I say that because I don't want to run the risk of experiencing any Philly kind of brotherly love out in the parking lot after church today. All right, so I love you. I commend you. So my point here is that it's not enough to, have a, uh, to uh, say that you have brotherly love. True love, true brotherly love must be demonstrated in action, in attitude, and in approach to one another. It must be, it must be seen and visible and felt. And that's really the point of these, these verses today. These verses that we're looking at this morning tell us that Christians are to love one another. But it's a different kind of love than that that we find in the world. It's not love in word only. It's a sincere, unhypocritical, brotherly love that expresses itself both in attitude and in action. It's a 
uh, genuine and sincere love that's possible only because of salvation. It's only possible because of the new birth, and this is the message of these verses today. If we could boil it down, if we could boil these verses down to one single sentence, we could say it like this. Since you've been born again through the living and abiding word, love one another. Since you have been born again through the living and abiding word, now love one another. We are called to love fellow believers with a sincere brotherly love. This is a love that is discernible. It is measurable. It is testable in real life. And as we look at these verses, we'll see that there are, there are two commands here today, along with one cause, one foundation that motivates us and gives us hope to persevere in loving one another. So the first command, love one another. First command is found in the second half of verse 22. You look with me here. Love one another earnestly. Peter could not be more simple or more direct. Love one another. Love one another earnestly. Love one another from a pure heart. We are called to a sincere brotherly love. Love one another, he calls us. Now, these different qualifiers to love one another are important. First off, we are called to love one another with a brotherly love. This isn't to love one another as though you're brothers. This is love one another because you are brothers. We are to love one another sincerely, not in pretense. This isn't a call merely to uh, put up with or to accept one another. This isn't a call to tolerate one another merely. This is a call to sincere love. And more than that, we are to love one another earnestly, from a pure heart. It must be deep and, inten- and intense. The word here for earnestly means something like stretched or strained. It's the same word, actually, that is used to describe Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, there are many ways that our love as Christians are to be expressed. We're to love the world, yes. We're to have compassion on the lost. We're certainly supposed to love our families, our spouses, our children, We are to love others as we love ourselves, but by commanding Christians to love one another, Peter is giving directions to Christians specifically to love fellow believers. This might seem like a no-brainer. Why why does Peter call us to love one another? Is is this not obvious? Christians, we're in the church together. We, We should understand this intuitively. This should be natural to what we do, right? Why does Peter feel the need to spill this out for us? Well, he spells it out because as we've seen throughout scriptures, we've seen in in churches, you think of the church in Corinth in particular. We we heard a message uh, a number of weeks ago from 1 Corinthians 13 on the call to love one another because love doesn't absolutely come naturally. We can, can, it, it can be challenging in the church even for all kinds of reasons. It isn't the easiest thing to do. Think about it. If you're out in the world, not in the church, but out in the world, the friends that you have are generally, largely, generally speaking, people like you, right? They are people who are like you. They are people who you click with, people that you get along with, people that share common interests. And so you find the friendships that exist out there in the world are oftentimes uh, predictable, right? You look, at, you look at people oftentimes and you say, okay, I understand why those people are friends. You see people walking you know, with the same jersey on. You say, okay, they cheer for the same team I get, or they play for the same team. That makes sense. You see people who are friends, you think, yeah, that, it's just not surprising. They like the same kind of music. They have the same interests in sports. They have a common cultural background. They enjoy the same types of activities. Their kids are on the same sports teams together. There are common bonds that unite them that are discernible and understandable. These are, there are people who gravitate to others that they are simply comfortable around. It's just not, it's not surprising to see those bonds and to see those kinds of friendships. But something different happens when you come into the church, doesn't it? You come into the church, and it's a different approach because we are among others who are oftentimes very different from us. We have different cultural backgrounds. We have different interests. We, have, we cheer for different sports teams. We, we might vote differently. We might uh, have different convictions about how we school our children. And so people may be very different from us and sometimes different in a way that is difficult. Sometimes in your, maybe in your community group, you have somebody there that has a sense of humor that is just unbearably sarcastic. You know anybody like that? 
This happens sometimes, and it can be hard, and, and maybe it grates on you. Maybe you walk away, and you're, and you're talking to your spouse, and you say, can you believe that that guy said that, laughed, thought it was funny? Maybe you consider yourself warm and friendly and outgoing, and you look around, and you think, you know, the, the people around me, they're, they're just, um, they're reserved, they're shy, they're, they're not particularly out fr- uh, friendly or outgoing. It, it's difficult to get to know them. Sometimes it can be hard to express this brotherly love toward others in the church. Maybe it's the other way around for you. Maybe, maybe you consider yourself quiet and introspective, thoughtful, something of an introvert. And the people in your community group are, are, are so brash and loud. It's just difficult to relate to them. Why, why are they talking incessantly? None of you would ever think those kinds of thoughts, right? Right? Sometimes it can be difficult because people just have different interests than you. It's more superficial. But this is life in the church together. We are called to gather together with people of all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of different interests united in our identity in Christ. And that means that we have all kinds of different personalities and convictions and interests. And and so it can be difficult to uh, to love one another as well. I don't know how many times I have had the thought... Uh, in this church and, and, and churches I've been part of in the past, that a number of the people around me aren't people who, would, who just naturally gravitate toward me. A, a lot of you, you, you have mercy toward me, and so you come to me because you, you see, hey, I can, I, can, I can love this man by the power of the Spirit. But you know, normally out on the street, you wouldn't just naturally go up and, and say, hey, that's somebody that I want to talk to. And vice versa, if it weren't for Christ in me by the power of the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't naturally become friends with a a number of people that I have dear, loving, deep relationship with. I have had friendships with, in my life with people who are very different from me. And we, we, we just laugh on our, on our own pastoral team. We have very different backgrounds and personalities. And, uh, and so we, we talk about our upbringings and, and things that we did, and it's just so radically different. It, it's just amazing uh, to see that we are such dear friends now. This is life in the church, though. Take, take choosing a community group, for instance. It's not primarily about finding people that you just click with. It's not, we don't, we don't go to community group because these are people that we're just comfortable around naturally. It's about finding people who help you grow. It's about finding a group where you can take the gifts that God has given you, the gifts that God has called you to steward, and to invest those in particular people. You see, you can't apply this call to love one another if you're not vitally connected to community. The assumption here is that you're part of people's lives enough that you can help others grow in Christ. Is that your experience? Do you you benefit from from the care and from the love of others? Do you give yourself to loving others earnestly in this way? This can be uncomfortable at times, trying to carry on a conversation with somebody who is just so different from you. But these are the people that we are called to love earnestly, sincerely, from a pure heart. And this is a, it's a simple command, isn't it? Love one another. It's a simple command, but it has broad application in all of our lives. There are folks in this room, many of whom you know well, and some, some people in this room maybe you don't know at all, some in the church that you don't know at all. There are people here that for whatever reason, it may be difficult for you to get to know because of any of the aforementioned reasons. But God's word here calls, one, calls us, calls you and me to love these people earnestly from a sincere and pure heart. Now, it's, rem- it's, it's important to remember here that Peter is writing to a people in exile. Peter, Peter's writing to people who are encountering some kind of opposition. It wasn't physical exile. It, it, it wasn't likely the kind of persecution that, uh, you, that Bart was referencing this morning about uh, you know, people who were uh, persecuted by the government, cracking down on, on them, sending in troops, driving them out of the city. It was probably more of a cultural persecution. They, they, they were shunned by, by society. It was unbelieving people in the world uh, that were um, you just opposing Christians, mocking Christians, opposition to the gospel, perhaps uh, people who are shunned from society. Today, we might call that getting canceled. Have you seen anybody get canceled for their Christian beliefs? Have you seen a news story about somebody's Christian beliefs getting them kicked off their uh, sports team or fired from their job? These Christians understood this and experienced this. 
businesses that were boycotted simply because they were owned and run by Christians. So they were encountering cultural opposition that was perhaps not unlike our life and our experience today. And there are times that many of us encounter that kind of cultural opposition, and and there's a kind of persecution that brings Christians together, a kind of of heat that, that gathers our communities together and strengthens them, doesn't we? Come together in these moments. And sometimes this this cultural opposition can actually fracture and divide Christians. Maybe this morning you're aware of of churches and Christians that are are divided over various things, over different issues in the world. And so Peter is calling us here to love one another in these moments in particular Because we have a shared identity. We never want to take that for granted. We never want to gloss over that. We never want to lose grasp of the importance of that shared identity. These these truths that we confessed this morning about regeneration, about justification, about adoption, these truths are infinitely more important than anything else that we would hold in common in this world. Anything anything that that we would gather around pales in comparison to these, this shared identity. We are called to stand together as exiles in this land of opposition, looking together to the return of the Lord, encouraging one another, strengthening one another until that day appears, building one another up, loving one another because we are the family of God. And church, I want to encourage you this morning because I'm not bringing this word. I I didn't choose this word to bring as a corrective this morning. I'm not trying to fix something that's broken here. John and Bart and I don't sit around saying, gosh, our church is so divided and so unloving and so cold and inhospitable. The opposite is the case. I want to commend you this morning because this church is known for our love for one another. I love hearing stories. You know, in this season where we haven't been able to gather as frequently and as robustly, I've had more phone calls and Zoom calls with you, and I've loved hearing stories from many of you and from the community group leaders about your love on display and, and experienced in the life of this church and in this community. I'm so grateful for the way that you apply this truth. I have seen members of our church who have walked in wonderful honesty and humility in their community group. In the re-engaged marriage group, that we're just starting a new one right now, uh, in the last couple of groups, and, and even in this first meeting uh, you know, this, uh, of this new group, we have seen people in humility loving one another and pressing into the Lord for His work in their lives. Sin being confessed of where you've fallen short, humbly inviting others into your world, asking for help, being transparent, and giving others the opportunity to walk with you in obedience to the Lord. This is love expressed toward one another, and it displays the beauty of the gospel. Christ is made very attractive. Christ is, Christ's attractiveness is, is displayed through a loving community. It is a compelling witness to an outside watching world. And of course, church, you have shown your uh, love for one another in the midst of various kinds of hardships and suffering as well. This season, we've seen all kinds of hardship and suffering, haven't we? And I've seen the church come together. I've, I, every week, I've, I, I get an email or I get a text message from somebody who is going to go serve somebody else, from somebody who just met with somebody else, and they were so encouraged about this person leaning into the Lord and asking for help. So church, I thank the Lord for his amazing work in your life and for your obedience and for your desire to obey this and to put this into practice, to put feet to this command. Love one another earnestly. But Peter doesn't simply give us a command. He goes on to demonstrate that what we're commanded to do is grounded in what God has already done. The foundation of the commands. This is point two. The foundation of the commands. You have been born again through the imperishable word of God. So here Peter gives us the motive and the power behind the command to love one another. And that cause we recited this morning is our new birth, regeneration. Your new birth is the cause for this kind of love. Now, when I was young, I had an experience that, that many of you maybe I will identify with. So I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but my parents would often chide my siblings and I uh, when we would leave the lights on around the house unnecessarily, when we would leave the door open, uh, particularly in the summer in Texas when the AC was blowing. It's just going out the door. We can't, we can't cool down the neighborhood, son. 
I heard that a thousand times. My parents might, might be, go out for dinner. When they'd come home uh, later that evening, you know, we'd, we'd be in, in a room or something like that, and every light in the house was on. It, megawatts of power just being spent and wasted. And they would come in, and they would, and they would tell us to turn off the lights. We generally do our best to comply, but inevitably we'd forget, and they'd remind us again. And I never understood, I never understood why this was such a big deal. Why was this such a big deal for them to you know, make such a fuss about until I got my own place and started paying my own electricity bill? Maybe you had a similar experience. And then I began to understand that uh, my par- why my parents were so insistent we turn off the lights and shut the doors when the AC was running. And now my own kids have their own stories of me telling them uh, the same way, the same things that my dad told me. Sometimes in life, it's helpful to understand the why behind the what, right? It's not just a command, but here's why. I'm fanatical about turning off the lights now. It is a regular thing in the house, uh, in my house, that I will walk through the house turning off lights, and then I'll hear Holly uh, say, hey, babe, if, if you want dinner, you've got to turn the lights back on in the kitchen. I'm in here cooking. <laughs> You know, I'll, I'll go through the house, you know, turn off the you know, lights in the rooms. One of my boys comes out, and he's like, he's like hey, Dad, come on, I'm, what's the deal here? Are we in the Middle Ages again? Do we need candles? So my, um, it helps to understand the why behind the what. And in these verses, Peter gives us the why behind the candle. He gives us the, uh, the, so- the source, the motivation, the foundation of why we're called to love one another. Look again at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. He begins here, actually, with a motive. Peter is referring here in these these verses to the initial act of obedience of conversion. Peter is simply describing their having become Christians. The purification of your soul, in verse 22, that's what happens in the new birth. We We just confess this in the catechism. The obedience to the truth refers to faith in the gospel. The truth is the gospel of Christ, and obedience to the gospel is faith in Christ. And so a sincere love for the brothers is the outcome and fruit of the new birth. And so he's saying, you've done this, having purified your souls by becoming a Christian for this person, for for this purpose, for a sincere brotherly love. Now, go do that thing for which you've been saved. Now, go love one another. This is why you've been saved. And if that wasn't clear enough, he goes on in the next verse to make it more explicit. Look at verse 23. He says, love one another since you have been born again. He has sandwiched this command, wrapping it in both motive and cause. He is saying, here is why you do this. Not just because I'm telling you, do it because that is what you were saved for. The new birth is the basis and the reason and the motivation for this kind of love. It fuels it. Love love one another earnestly because you've been born again. Because you've been saved for this sincere brotherly love. And Peter goes on to describe what this new birth is like. He explains, it is not with perishable seed, but with imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Verses 23 through 25 describe the new birth as having a permanent supernatural quality to it. It's not the frail, fleeting life that comes from the perishable human birth. No, this is supernatural, indestructible, undying. That is the new life in you that you've been given through regeneration. And Peter goes on to quote Isaiah 40, very famous passage, speaking to the Israelites who were were in captivity at the time, giving them the hope of the imperishable word of God. It is not like the grass or the flower that will perish and wither. It will endure forever. That is our hope. This is helpful this time of year, especially because in the summertime, if you've lived in Texas for any length of time, if you have a home and you have grass that you take care of, you know that right now your grass might be green and flourishing if you're watering it, uh, but August is coming, and if you don't pay like $1,000 a month in electricity, that grass is going to turn brown, it's going to wither and die. It's going to look terrible. You get a note from the HOA if you have one of those. But that is not the kind of power at work in you. Peter's saying, listen, if it was up to us alone, we would be like that grass. We would wither and die, but God does not leave us alone. He has planted his seed in us, and we are continually nourished by the word of God that is imperishable and undying. The word of the Lord remains forever. 
Brothers and sisters, we have received this word. When it says here in verse 25 that this word is the good news that was preached to you, you and I have received this word through the preaching of the word. Bart prayed about this uh, this morning, about, uh, about your word going forth. In the merciful and kind providence of God, the word has been proclaimed in this part of the world. Churches like this one have been established as a result. And we have heard the good news proclaimed to our hearts. And by the grace of God Almighty, we have confessed faith and received salvation. Your acceptance of this word has resulted in the new birth, regeneration. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, here's what's happened to you. Listen to this. Your sins have been forgiven. God's judgment towards you has been exhausted. You have been robed in righteousness, adopted as God's son or daughter. You have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Your citizenship is no longer in this world, but in heaven. Death has been defeated and eternal life is yours forever. This is cause to sing. This is cause to praise the Lord and to shout hallelujah. This is true for everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in light of this glorious reality, how should we live? We're to love one another. Church, there will be times in this church that loving one another will prove increasingly challenging. And that is the time to remember that our hope is not in us. It's in the enduring power of the word at work in you. God's word, friends, it gets stuff done in our hearts. It works. We we are passive most of the time. We simply put ourselves in front of it, and it works in us. Have you ever had that experience? Is Is that what you experience in the Lord? It gets something done in the beginning of the Christian life, awakening our dead hearts to come alive to God. And it gets something life ongoingly in the Christian life as we continue to come to Him. We've been transformed by the work of God through His Word to love one another. Do you see what Peter's doing here? He is connecting our attitude and behavior to the gospel. This is what it means to be gospel-centered, friends. It's not, it's not just do more, try harder. It's not, okay, go out and just have a bunch of difficult conversations. He is connecting it to the gospel at work in you. We are called to reflect to others what we've received from God. And God simply does not give up on us. He doesn't get so annoyed by our sins that he, that he, he just you know, walks off removing his affection from us. Richard Baxter says that there is more mercy in God than sin in us. More mercy in Christ than sin in us. Isn't that amazing? And we get to reflect that to others. We get to show others what God is like when we show them that same kind of mercy and patience and earnest and sincere love. So love one another earnestly because you've been born again through the imperishable seed of the word. Finally, last point, long for the pure milk of the word. Look look down again at chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. What Peter is emphasizing here is that in a, in a community called to love one another, there is no place for certain things. There is no place for malice, no place for, for seeking to inflict damage on one another through, uh, through our words or through our deeds, nor is there a place for any deceit, a desire to gain advantage over one another by trickery. There is absolutely no place for hypocrisy. That is, or insincerity, that is a, a desire to make an outward show of righteousness when inwardly we are very far from righteousness. There's no place in the community of believers for envy, that is, the desire for some privilege or benefit that belongs to someone else, and resentment that they have it and that we don't. Finally, there is no place in a community called to love one another for slander. Slander That is, any words that aim to harm people or to destroy their reputation. Speaking unflatteringly of another person. That's slander, brothers and sisters. We must guard vigilantly against these things. These things do not cultivate love. They kill love. So Peter writes about them. He writes about them with this language um, in a way that assumes that they've already been done away with. But he calls us to continue to put it away to stay on guard, to remain vigilant against these things as a community. 
And so in response to verse 1, we strive to put off those things and to cultivate a community of love. So there's no literal command in verse 1, but it, but it carries the force of a command, doesn't it? The main command here comes in verse 2. Look down again. It says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And when we ask, what is this pure spiritual milk? The answer comes back to us in verse 23. It is the living and abiding Word of God. If you have a New American Standard Bible, it actually translates it that way. Long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word. So if you, look at the, if you look at the arrangement of these verses, remember the chapter division isn't original to the text. When, when Peter was writing this, he didn't stop chapter 1 and then say, okay, new thought, chapter 2. That's why we're preaching it together this morning. Look at the arrangement. Verse 22 is about loving one another. Verse, verses 23 through 25 are about the enduring word. Chapter 2, verse 1 is again about loving one another. And verses 2 and 3 are again about the word. Do you see the connection? Do you see what he's doing here? He's making a point. He's emphasizing the connection between the Word and loving one another. The Word is the means by which we are born again. God's Word abides forever. And in verse 25, that very Word is identified as the gospel that we have received. Therefore, Peter is referring to the Word when he mentions pure spiritual milk so that we would understand that the way in which we grow, listen, the way in which you grow is nothing other than the nourishment of the Word of God. The same way that we're saved, we continue growing in the Lord by being nourished in the Word. So long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word, Peter says. We don't want to misread these verses when it says like newborn infants. You know, there's other sections in, in Romans and in Hebrews that refer to believers as, uh, as infants, as newborns, as immature, needing milk and not solid food. That's not what Peter's saying here. Okay, Peter is making a different point here. What he is saying is that uh, this milk is nourishing for all who have been born again. Regardless of how long you've been walking with the Lord, you should remain. Jesus said you should come to him like, like a child. And Peter's saying we should remain like newborn infants longing for that pure spiritual milk. You never outgrow your need for this kind of nourishment from the Word of God. We never get to a point where we say, yeah, I read my Bible a lot uh, the first few years as a Christian. But now I, I don't need it as much. I mean, it's, it's all familiar. It's nothing new. Now, we ongoingly need the nourishment of the Word. We're to long for this. We're to crave this nourishment the way that a newborn infant craves his mother's milk. And you've all seen that, right? The way that a, an infant, you know, when it's time to eat, he knows it or she knows it. And she's looking around and she starts to get fussy. She lets you know, I need food. My, my youngest is, is two and he's beyond the milk stage but he's still not waiting around for us to say, okay, son, it's time to eat. He is looking around. He's opening up cabinet doors. He's in the pantry. He's opening up the refrigerator, pulling food out, grabbing whatever he can because he wants nourishment. Too much, if you ask me. He's longing for food. That is how Peter says that we should crave, that we should long for the nourishment of the pure spiritual milk of the Word of God. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, Peter is not here implying or, or casting doubt on the reality of anyone's salvation, but he, he does ask it in such a way, he does say it in such a way that should lead us to, to consider for a moment. Have I tasted that the Lord is good? Because the, the assumption that he's, the, the assumption in the question, the assumption in the statement is that the answer is yes. You're, you're right. I have tasted that the Lord is good, and I want more of that. I want more of that. I want to long for that. He's referencing Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When you, say, when you taste that something is good, you come back to it more and more. And if you have then, you will long for him all the more. You will crave communion with him. You will desire to spend time with him. You, like the man of Psalm 1, meditating on his word day and night. And by that, you will grow up into salvation. You will mature. You will be conformed progressively more and more into the image of God himself. And the word here, look at this. 
This language is passive, friends. You think about 2 Corinthians 3.18 that says, Beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being changed from one degree of glory to another. Well, here too, it is saying that the pure, by, by the pure spiritual, spiritual milk of the word, we will grow up into salvation. Our job is to long for the word. Our job is to place ourselves in a position to receive nourishment from the word, and God does the work. Isn't that glorious? So long for the, for the pure spiritual milk of the word. Well, I want to invite the, the worship team to, to come back up. And as they do so, I just want you to consider, has this been your experience? Have you experienced this kind of longing for the word? Is it, is it your experience that, that loving one another is something that you enjoy doing, that you feel a conviction called to do? Or is this challenging? Does God seem far off in this season? Perhaps it's been a while since you've enjoyed the relish of the Word of God, and, and it just feels like one more thing that you're not doing right. Well, friends, I have good news for you this morning because God invites you to come and feast on His Word. God offers to come and work in your heart, and God, call, God promises to work through you in the lives of others. So lean into this and seek to grow in loving one another, longing for the pure spiritual milk of the word and encouraging one another every step of the way. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for your people. We thank you, Father, for for those who have uh, loved us enough to preach the gospel to us. We thank you for the gift of those who have given their lives to translating your word, that we can have it in our hands, in our homes. And I pray now, Father, that you would strengthen us, help us, Father, change us more and more into a more loving people, into a people that long for your word and that are nourished by your word. We pray that in so doing, Father, that you would cultivate in our church a more compelling witness to your gospel as people come in and see the family of God loving one another and longing after your word. We thank you, Father, for your work in us. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.